Kamlesh D. Patel, affectionately known as Daji, is the fourth and current spiritual guide of the global heartfulness movement. He has spent the last four decades training people across the globe in heartfulness meditation. Author of numerous bestsellers, environmentalist, entrepreneur, speaker, and pharmacist by training, his teaching integrates science and spirituality to give a deeper understanding of the purpose of human existence. Yet in the four decades of teaching, he has never written a book specifically about the 16 chakras until now. Spiritual Anatomy, Meditation, Chakras, and the Journey to the Center. Daji has created an atlas for consciousness to map us back to our hearts, the seat of life and the source of love and peace. And now he is here to share that wisdom with me. So welcome everybody. I am so excited and honored and deeply grateful to have Daji here with me, who is the author of the latest USA Today bestseller, Amazon bestseller, uh, Spiritual Anatomy, Meditation Chakras and Journey to the Center. Welcome to the show, Daji. Thank you, Sarit, and hello, everyone. I'm so, as I just said to everybody, I'm so honored that you're here with me today. Uh, I've read this book cover to cover, and it is literally, as you say, like an atlas, an atlas to the soul. I don't even know if soul is the word, uh, but it feels like I've been given and we've been given this treasure map to go on, as you say, an adventure. And yes. Yeah. And so before we dive into it, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Uh, and I was wondering if you would be willing to share just a few words to center us all, to connect us to heart in this conversation, if you would be willing. Sure, sure. I, you know, often we ask such questions like, what is soul? Is there a soul? <clears throat> what is God? Is he really there or is he really there? But one thing for sure, to understand what I'm going to say next, imagine a situation where mother is being delivered of a baby. She's in the hospital, in the, in the ward. Husband is anxiously waiting for her to deliver her child. As soon as baby is delivered, baby begins to cry. No baby comes smiling or laughing. Baby begins to cry. And that's a sign that something that gives us life has come together. It's accompanied with this body. If the baby doesn't cry, that means doctors declare it as a still baby, or they will try at that moment to resuscinate. They tap, they turn the baby upside down and tap the back, try to stimulate the heart or the lungs. And if this baby still doesn't cry, that means everyone in the family will have to cry. Mommy starts crying. It's the first time and last time that mother, having delivered a child, and hearing that cry, she smiles. That's the only time baby's cry makes mother smile. And one thing is for sure, that this entity, whether you call soul or you call it life force or you call it Atman, what we call really does not matter. But that entity is always with us, within us. My life force is within me. My life force is not somewhere in Mecca. My life force is not in somewhere in the Himalayan caves or in Jerusalem. My soul, my life force is in me. I have to experience that within me. I have to realize that it's within me. Stop looking for him outside. So that destroys the entire structure of externalizing that spiritual entity with which all the religions are very busy 
externalization of the inner spirit. And that is why we have so many problems today because of this externalization of godly entity. Once we move away from this inner entity, we begin to compare. We begin to experience it outside. It's a wrong way, wrong path. And with the wrong methodology, you cannot have the right results. Journey is inward. And when we go inward and begin our spiritual journey, we experience the movement of this, I would say, the consciousness from one level to another level. And because of that, we are able to see the luminosity, as I, I don't call it as I don't have any better word than using such words as luminosity or light. As more and more we become meditative and purity holds us, purity and simplicity becomes our foundation, then we are able to experience deeper levels of consciousness, higher level of consciousness. I'm deliberately using deeper level and higher level of consciousness here for a reason because all of us have some level of consciousness. If we have to compare in modern uh, telephonic language, we, we say, you know, there was analog phone, then mm -hmm. became digital phone, then became 2G phone, 3G phone, and now 5G phone, and the bandwidth goes on increasing, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Compare that with analog. Only voice. Now, <clears throat> our available consciousness today, it is like analog. <laughs> and when, when, when we meditate, it becomes broader and broader and broader. So, our consciousness expands into deeper level of subconsciousness and also soars higher into sky of superconsciousness. And that's the main purpose of meditation, that we dive deeper within ourselves. The heartfulness way of practices, which I have described at length, and how we move from one chakra to another chakra within this lifespan, it is not that the heaven is waiting for us somewhere. It's within us. When our heart becomes or imbibes the same quality as divine, then divinity has to descend. Lord Jesus also says that very emphatically, that once we become children-like, a child-like, innocent, that purity reigns in us. We don't have to, we need not go to heaven. There is nothing like that. Heavenly phenomena, heavenly gifts descends in our heart as and when we are ready. So meditation is a way preparing us to invite that divinity in our heart. So divinity becomes our guest for some time and we are the host also as divinity and one day the guest and the host becomes one. Woo! I love that. See? And there is a marriage between the two and the journey begins then. When husband and wife they come together it's the beginning. Living together how they move on and lead a happy spiritual life, harmonious life. And that happens when we are in sync with each other. When my consciousness, my existence is in conflict with myself only. It, it, it will not be in conflict with divinity anyway. You are in conflict with yourself. Stop blaming divinity. <laughs> You are not happy with yourself anyway. Meditation makes us recognize this very fact. That look within yourself and see how beautiful you look or how ugly you are. And based on that look, you can change 
your inner world, your inner dimensions. Daji, so this book is really for people to be able to come back to their divinity, to come back to center, to journey within, to find the truth of who we are. Yep, yep, yep. I cannot say more than this. I would say I would guarantee it 200% that when you meditate with this heartfulness way of practice, where prana is infused in us, pranahuti is transmitted to us, and we experience it. It is not a matter of make-believe. You can have a placebo meditation without pranahuti, and you can have meditation with this transmission of pranahuti, and see the difference for yourself. You know, you talk about that the best gift that we can give ourselves is you know, to the universe is the gift of our transformed selves. And so our goal is to come back to ourselves and to listen to our hearts or to be led or guided by our hearts. Would you say that all of our hearts share or speak the same wisdom? Heart always speaks the same wisdom. Always. Mm -hmm. And that is the wisdom of the truth. Wisdom of true freedom. You see, I cannot demand a freedom that can destroy me. That is destructive freedom. Freedom is always there for personal growth, each other's growth. Freedom is always there to do the right thing. God cannot give me the permission even to do the wrong thing. God will never stop me when I'm doing the right thing. He becomes important when I'm doing just the right. He cannot interfere. And he chooses also not to interfere when we are doing the wrong thing because he has given us absolute freedom. It's up to us how to make use of that freedom, either for growth or for destruction. Now, when, we, when it comes to the heart, can heart misguide me? I would say never. Heart will never, can never misguide us. How to understand the language of the heart? For example, when I'm on a crossroad and you're questioning your heart, should I go in this direction or that direction. For example, someone loves me so much, someone likes me so much, and I like someone so much and I love someone so much. Whom to marry? Right? Should I start this business or continue with my employment? So decisions of that type, crucial decisions, heart can guide us immensely. When we reflect back, on our past and analyze that whenever I have gone wrong with my decisions, find out what was my heart speaking before I made that decision. Did you listen to your heart at that time? And when you became extremely successful with your decision, what was your heart guiding at that moment? Okay. Whenever something has to happen naturally, heart doesn't speak much. Whenever something goes wrong against nature or against as it should be, then heart will speak louder. It's like you are going on a date, even when you're married. Listen to your heart, what it says. Your heart will become heavier, it will start pounding. Or when you are with your husband, does your heart beat faster or become heavier? No, it is as natural as that. When I have to say, or when I ask you your name, what's your name? And you say, my name is Elizabeth. Or when, as a teenager, recall your days, your mommy asked you. Mom says, where were you, Sherry? And you are entering the house at 12 o'clock in the morning. 
And he said, Mommy, I was uh, doing my homework with my friend. Nobody right? believed <laughs> She would believe it because she trusts you. But what happens to your heart at that moment? Oh, it beats. Pain really? faster, right? So that is the language. Anytime we do wrong things or something that is not going to be very natural, there will be some hesitation. Often, I would say always heart gives us the signal of discomfort whenever something wrong is going to happen. Unquestioned, unsolicited advice is given by the heart. Often we don't listen because there is immediate benefit, immediate pleasure in doing some things. And there is some level of devil's adventure. <laughs> in doing doing wrong things and we say to the heart why don't you shut up for now let me do what I want to enjoy this right. doctor, told, doctor told you not to do certain things right? that this is against your health don't take such and such things or don't or perform some exercises now and then but you don't want to listen and it's always the case when we bring in the aspect of entropy, for example, entropy means something which is degenerating if we don't interfere with a positive force. Right? Now, that means the effort is always required. When I have to move from low level of consciousness to higher level of consciousness, effort is required. When I have to drop from the higher level of consciousness to lower level of consciousness, no effort is required. Right. Until afterwards. <laughs> yes. So degeneration, destructive things, doesn't need effort. It's just for any adventurous thing, for transformative things, you have to put in the effort, you see. Some mm -hmm. level of discipline is required. And is that why do you think most people don't end up trusting their heart or they say that they don't because there's been pain in our lives and so we, we try to protect ourselves with our minds? Because that's what I'm really trying to understand is why so many of us don't follow the guidance of our hearts. Is it because what you're saying it's too difficult, too much effort? That is true. It's too much of an effort to follow the heart because heart is always interested in our evolution. Mm -hmm. Right, and evolution requires efforts. Not listening to the heart and having immediate pleasure is easier. Right, but in the process, we pay a big price. Yeah, that makes so much sense because in the evolution, things are going to be challenging. We're pushed to grow and expand, and it's hard for people. And so, it's much easier to stay safe, right? In our my. See, in nature, unlike the human race, human species, everything happens based on the genetic uh, order. It happens in our lives also, in, with our physical system. Genetic order is definitely there. But we have the freedom to influence this change because of our mind. You know, it seems so simple to just the idea of just going within and, and, and connecting and being there. And yet so many are challenged by this. And what I love about your book is that it gives us the GPS, the guide, the guide. But I will say this, and I'll be totally transparent. I just learned the seven chakras and now you're throwing 16 at me. <laughs> so I was like, what? Mind blown. Can you talk? I'll I the not just 16, the infinite chakras. Don't, don't give that to me this early in the morning for me. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you talk chakras. to that about the chakras? Because I know that I have people that are watching that don't understand their significance or what they are. Can you give us just a little insight? Definitely. Chakras are the energy vortexes in our system, in our physical system. Let me give you an example. When you like something, or when you dislike something, or 
you are attracted towards something and you are repelled by something. Imagine what happens to you when you close your eyes. What sort of vibrations it creates when you are attracted against when you are repelled. Imagine where those vibrations are settling or focused. Let me give you another example. When you have very angry bout and you lash out at someone and then you become quiet after some time. Imagine what happens to your inner system and where those vibrations are hitting you. They will gravitate only towards that part of the body centered there when you're angry. When you are joyful, likewise it will center and gravitate towards that particular center. When you have immense peace and tremendous contentment in, in you, imagine those vibrations, what's happening. Imagine for a moment where you are hand to mouth and you are worried about how am I going to have lunch today? I don't have enough money. Or how am I going to pay the rent? Children's school fees, clothes, things like that, material world. What happens to you at that time and where these vibrations are hitting you in your system? When your heart becomes so compassionate and melting, what happens to you at that time? Which part of your body is vibrating? When you are attracted towards someone, and let's imagine for a moment that person rejects you vehemently, what happens to you at that time? And feel the vibrations. Each such episode will hit you only at that chakra. So this is what I call, where all these vibrations are settling at various chakras based on the emotions. They, they gather that. And as we advance beyond all these concepts of the worldly affairs, what I just said are worldly matters, love matters, money matters, what else is there in this worldly life? Anything more than that? I think that's it. <laughs> but when you come up to a spiritual realm, there are chakras which most yogic books don't mention. And those chakras are related to your spiritual growth in cosmic, paracosmic, and regions beyond that or dimensions beyond this realm. And these are also experienceable. As we move on beyond this uh, dualities of life, each duality, for example, contentment versus um, infinite desires, or Peace in the heart versus restlessness. Love versus hate. Courage or fear versus discouragement and, 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 and lack of fear. Clarity in your heart and confusion. These are dualities. <laughs> and each of these duality settles on one particular chakra. Peace and Restlessness will settle on one chakra, which is almost three fingers below our right nipple. Right? Contentment, three fingers below our left nipple. Love and hatred, three fingers above our left nipple. Fearless and fear, three fingers above the right nipple. And when we draw the triangle here, that is the center that you must have studied, the sixth or sixth fifth chakra in a traditional way, right? Kanta chakra or Visuddhi chakra. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, as we go, Agya chakra, it's full of power. Right? And then we go further up. Now, going further up, what happens there? The ego manifests there more than desires. 
ego, not just about the family interactions with each other. Ego clashes more in the mundane world with the people we love the most. Right? Look at the relationship with majority of families, husband and wife. See how the ego clashes. And we go when ego clashes, you see the discord and uh, lack of harmony that comes out of that clash. That is at a personal level. But when you go beyond that, which I was trying to share with you, then too, we, when you offer a prayer, what happens there is myself and the higher entity. There's still a duality. And when this self-identification slowly and slowly dissolves, my consciousness also dissolves to that extent. Because now consciousness that was centered or contracted within me, now its expansion begins because now I am in resonance with divinity that is infinite. And this is how our consciousness expands when we move from cosmic or Brahman to Mandal. Brahma in Sanskrit means expansion. Nothing more than that. So, and when we go from cosmic to paracosmic, then too there is a different level of expansion. And with that expansion, now you are nearing and nearing and nearing, but never reaching the absolute. It's an infinite journey. And, and, and the journey continues like that. And all these are experienceable. All these are experienceable within this lifetime. And whosoever wants to meditate with this method, in the very first session itself, you'll feel a biggest shift that you ever felt in your consciousness. Because of this pranavuti, because of this transmission of pranavuti that it offers. Otherwise, this system is as useless as any other one. Well, I think for those who are intrigued by this, your book is really giving us as we said, a roadmap, an atlas to the chakras to be able to clear them, right? To clear the energy so we have a clearer path straight to our heart, to our center. And I imagine that that's ultimately, I'm not speaking for you, I'll ask you, but your goal with writing this book. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, So let me ask I have so many questions for you, but we don't have time. I just want to dig into your, <laughs> I want to dive into your heart. What, um, well, I'll ask a simple question for me or the one that I love the most. What brings you joy? A good conversation and good state of silence also helps me. You know, when we are sitting quietly, imagine mature love between a couple who has spent 60 years together. Do they converse? They don't. They walk silently. If wife raises her eyebrows and say, a husband understands what she wants. Speech fails. A time comes in couple's life where we resonate without speaking much. Of course, we have good conversations, but that's a beauty. That's a beauty when in silence we understand each other. Joy comes in many different ways. If you anchor up with joy, be prepared for its opposite also. Mm -hmm. That is very wise. So we transcend all these things. Whatever comes, my Lord, I accept. When you said, yeah, I think that is when I think about peace and when I think about joy is the full acceptance of this moment, of being fully who you are in this moment and that acceptance. And I'll let you know that I downloaded your Heartfulness app and I've been meditating in the mornings and with the app and there is. There was this beautiful moment the first day that I did it where you 
simply ask for us to think on or connect with the divine light within. And it just sparked something, this divinity, that reminder. And so in those moments where my mind wants to lead the way, I remind myself of the divine light within and connect to that. And it's just been this beautiful process or this beautiful shift for me. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Shari. But I would highly recommend you, since you're in Los Angeles, I know a trainer there. When he meditate with the trainer, it makes a big shift. Of course, with the app, you can meditate in the privacy of your home. And you don't need anybody else. But then when we meditate with someone, that also makes a big difference. And when we meditate in a group, that's also another dimension. Yeah. So let's start walking first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we'll start running and then we'll start flying. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's the flying. I want to end. I don't want to end our conversation, but I'm going to end uh, our conversation with something that you wrote in your book. Um uh, because it's what resonated so much with me. And you said, time is short, the journey is long, and now is the moment. Yes. So thank you for being here oh, now with me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, joyful day. Thank you. Thank you. You too.